Whosoever shall put away his wife, except to be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. Matthew 19, verse 9. You and I know there are a range of teachings on this subject, and the teachings that are on this subject that do not align with the Bible have ripped the church apart in many places because people have been unwilling to stand for the truth or ignorant of the truth or whatever the case may be. They are not taking the truth and using it in the situation. And it's a sad thing. It's rent up, it's torn apart many homes. We've talked about many moral issues and all of these issues attack the home. You think about that, the fact that there are, there are just a few institutions that are set up by God himself. The home, the government, the church. And what is the devil doing? The devil wants to tear apart all of those institutions or, or turn them to working for him. That's his desire. He wants to rip apart every one of those institutions and, he, or, and then turn them into working for him. All of these issues that we've looked at are, are focused on attacking the Christian, the individual, people who are, that could become Christians or people that are already Christians. The devil wants all of them in his service, wants none of them to serve God. And this subject has taken many people who have, been, who have obeyed the gospel of Christ they have lived lives that otherwise were faithful in the service of the Lord. But then when this subject enters their lives, whether it be directly, that is, the person and, and his or her spouse, depending on who you're talking about, or indirectly, the person, someone else in that person's family, and all of a sudden positions change. But we want to know what does the Bible say? And we want to look at a few things about this. And so when we look at divorce, it's a very sad subject for the most part. And I want us to look at these three ideas about it. I want to look at the original plan. In other words, divorce was not part of the original plan, right? I want to look at prevention. In other words, how do I prevent divorce? Because that's the goal, right? Everyone, Whenever someone grows up and they get that person gets married, the goal is that they never get divorced. That's the goal. In fact, if, if someone marries with another goal in mind regarding divorce, in other words, well, if I just, whatever, I can just dispense with it and, work and move on. That's the wrong goal. That's the, that marriage is already doomed to fail for multiple reasons, and we'll go into that. But then we want to talk about that one exception that the Lord himself gave, as I just quoted a moment ago in Matthew 19.9. So we're going to look at those few things. So let's, let's look first in Matthew 19, at the, at the chapter itself, those first few verses, where the, these Pharisees come to Jesus, Matthew 19, verse 3, the Pharisees also came unto him and said, or came unto him, tempting him, saying unto him, is it lawful to put away, is it lawful to put away, for a man to put away his wife for every cause? In other words, can, is it just any old reason? Does it matter? And he answered and said unto them, he began a lot of his answers with these few words. Have ye not read? What's he doing? He's pointing them back to the authority. He's pointing them back to where they should have. In other words, you should already know the answer to the question. It's already been given, but you have reasons for not wanting to know the answer to the question. Have ye not read? That he which made them at the beginning made them male and female. I said the first thing we're going to talk about is the plan. It, the divorce was not a part of the original plan. That's what Jesus does when he's asked this question. Can, can a man put away his wife for just any reason? Just, just any old reason? Does it matter? And, you know, I'm, I'm very... This subject... I don't know how to describe my... I don't want to quite say I'm very passionate about the subject in the sense, but I guess I am passionate about this subject. Because I look around and I see young people and I don't want them to fall into traps. And I know what has happened to people and I know what terrible situations have been produced by people not following the plans of God. 
And I know the whole congregations have been just basically sunk by this subject. So he says, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they twain, they two, old word for two, shall be one flesh. So you kind of have that model, right? Leave, leave father and mother. In other words, we're no... Yes, you're still related to those people. Yes, they're still part of your family, but you're in a whole new situation now. You are no longer under that family the same way you were before. That's how many marital problems happen. Is, will mom and dad do this? That's fine if it's something that's, if it's of, it's, if it's of a, a, an opinion, a matter of an opinion, they can do it their way. But don't try to run, you know, people can create problems by doing trying to do everything well, the way mom and dad do. Those could be good and those can be fine. But leave. Leave, he said, this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife. There's a new family there. They twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore there are no more twain. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Notice that again. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Notice who's doing the dividing there. Notice who's ripping apart that union. Notice who's the one that's destroying that home. What God has joined together, so that tells us what marriage is. Whenever two people make that commitment, and whenever they go to that, go through that step of saying we're of going through that process of getting married, they have basically allowed God to join them together. What God therefore hath joined together, let not man put asunder. In other words, man has no authority to step in and try to wreck this relationship that's been established by God himself. Verse 7, they say unto him, they, they thought they had him, right? That's what they always thought, but they never learned that they never got him. That, so they said unto him, why did Moses then, in other words, your answer is wrong, because, listen here, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away. Huh? Tell us that. Why? Why do you do that? If we're supposed to follow this original plan you mentioned. Well, the Lord doesn't say it's a bad question. In fact, he answers the question, doesn't he? Listen to the answer to the question. Moses he saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. Let me make a, just a quick comment here about this. This isn't Moses running off on some tangent on his own, going rogue from what the Lord wanted. Okay? When he says, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, this isn't Moses saying, I'm tired of hearing them, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to just let this be, even though that's not what God wants. God authorized it through Moses. Okay, let's be real clear about that part. But notice the why. Notice the why. Because of the hardness of your hearts. Suffered it to be so. But from the beginning it was not so. Let's look at an example of this or remind ourselves of another situation that will help us maybe align this in our minds a little bit. You know about that time in, in Israel's history whenever you had the period of the judges? And the period was defined by people doing that which was right in their own eyes, right? Judges 17, 6, Judges 21, 25. In fact, Judges 2.19 says they cease not from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. So they were very much bent on doing things their way. So much so, 1 Samuel 8, 7, they, or 1 Samuel 8, they, they had clamored for a king, right? They demanded a king. 1 Samuel 8, 7, the Lord speaks to Samuel and says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. Let me, let me pose this here. Is this not very similar? Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered it to be so. What does that mean? They had become so stubborn. They had become so hard-hearted. God allowed it. And I'm not here to get into the discussion of, well, what about... That's not even the point. The point is, these people had become so wicked so self-governed, so self-willed, so stubborn 
that God had said this thing about it. Just like 1 Samuel 8, he had said, you want a king? All right, you're going to get a king. And he told Samuel, and he said, look, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me, that I should not reign over them. Was that God's will? Was that God's original plan? No, his original plan, I mean, make it a parallel, right? The original plan was God rule over them. But they kept rebelling and refusing. I mean, was it the original plan for the world to be destroyed by a flood, Genesis 6 through 9? Was that the original plan? I'm not saying God was caught off guard by it. I don't mean to suggest anything of that sort. But what I'm saying is that's not what God wanted in the design of it all. That's not his desire. So what are we saying? Has man changed the path? Has man affected the pathway of things by his stubbornness and his sinfulness? You better believe it. Flood. Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, how many examples do we have to come up with that these things weren't a part of God's original plan, but man's stubbornness and iniquity and, and uh, self-willed nature led to this other option. So he, they think they've got him. Well, what about when Moses said it? He says, Moses, is because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered it to be so. But from the beginning, it was not so. So Jesus very much points back to that original plan. And after he said that, he said, And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except to be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. So I want us to look at a couple of things here, and I think this will move rather quickly. Let's look in Genesis 2 at that beginning and when you think about Genesis 1 and 2, you're looking at a period of time that's different from any other period in time, right? Genesis 1 and 2 is the world prior to sin. I mean, sin hasn't done anything to the world yet. Nothing has been defiled. Nothing has been in any way. No, no, no murder has taken place. No abortions have taken place. No, none of these moral issues that we've discussed, not, nothing of that sort has ever taken place by, at, at the time that you're reading Genesis 1 and 2. You've got the world prior to sin. Of course, we know sin entered the world in Genesis 3. But here in Genesis 1 and 2, you've got God creating the world. He spoke everything into existence. And on that sixth day, He created man. And He created a help meet for him. In other words, fitting for him, right? A woman. And He gave a law <coughs> regarding that situation. Did he not? Genesis chapter 2, verses 22 and, and following. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So very clearly that, that plan never originally involved divorce. The plan originally was set up so one man, one woman, they would join together, leave father and mother, cleave unto one another, and be one for all of their days. Till, as most wedding vows say, till death do us part. In other words, <coughs> at the point of whoever died first, that's when the union was no more, or would be no more, because after death there is no marriage. Romans 7, 4, right? So the original plan to be very plain about that, never included, never included divorce. And to be very clear about what I mentioned a moment ago, what the Pharisees point out to Jesus, asking about, well, Moses said we could do this. And Jesus said, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered it to be so. But from the beginning it was not so. That was under the old law, the law of Moses. 
Matthew 19, 9, Jesus' will on the matter. After he's pointed back to the beginning and he says, here's what shall be. Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. So I'm going to come back to it more to the exception here in a moment, but I want to I want to lay this out pretty clearly before we talk about. I think that fairly well deals with the original plan. The divorce was never part of it. But also, we want to say that when we want to, and you know, we've got young people in this audience, and maybe young people will hear this later on. And as we are encountering young people that we have a chance to talk to and influence about how they're making their decisions for their future and who they're going to marry, we need to, uh, that's, a, that's a serious responsibility. And we can help them a lot by pointing them to the Bible. But, so that original plan, very briefly I want to look at what Matthew 19, 9 basically lays out. The general rule, let me say this very specifically, the general rule is divorce plus remarriage equals adultery. That's the general rule. That's what's said in Luke 16, 18. The exception isn't even listed in Luke 16, 18. So the general, we know the difference between general and specific, right? You've got this general rule. In other words, it applies in, in, a, in a huge majority of situations, right? The, the most of the time, this is what's the, the rule. The general rule, you could say, is just like one plus one equals two, divorce. So you've got a, a, a scriptural marriage. Two people that have, say two people that have never been married before. That union is dissolved. The general rule, divorce plus one of those gets remarried, divorce plus remarriage, the general rule equals adultery. That's what Matthew 19, 19 teaches. But there's a specific exception. Except. Except it be for fornication. So he's saying very clearly, here's a general rule. Divorce plus remarriage equals adultery. There's just no other way of saying it. But the exception, except it be for fornication. So before we go a little further into that, put your kind of put your bookmark there and we'll go back to that exception in a moment, okay? I want to talk about how do we prevent it? How do we prevent it? Because homes are, and I'm not standing here acting as if there's not a divorce that ever took place that didn't need to happen. I realize there were divorces that needed to happen because of meeting that exceptional situation. Okay? homes, the church, and entire countries, which would be an extension of that third divinely established institution, right? Government, and thus the country. The home, the church, and countries are being destroyed by lack of respect for this union about which we speak right now. Why do... You want to know why people are doing things like abortion? Because the, the respect for this union has been lost. Not, that's not always the answer, but it is often the answer. You want to know why people are involved in drugs and gambling and other moral issues? Sometimes it's because they have lost the respect for this union or they were reared in a place that didn't teach them the kinds of things that would help them steer clear of such problems. And I'm telling you right now, marriage, divorce, and remarriage is a part of that. Because the home is what steers the direction of any nation. The home is what steers the direction of a congregation in a sense. 
In other words, if congregation is made up of families and all those families have no respect for the Word of God, guess what? That congregation has no respect for the Word of God. I realize the congregation, the preaching that's done in a congregation, the teaching that's done in a congregation can influence people and change them and help them for the better. That's, the, that's kind of the whole point. But marriage, divorce, and remarriage is a big deal, and it's a detriment to our society. The way it's been practiced, and the church has basically given up the fight as of however many years ago it was that Bales put forth his damnable doctrine. I don't even know. But I want us to look at some prevention. I think to consider the prevention, we've got to go to another passage. And there's several. What about Matthew 22, 37 and following, or 36 and following? Jesus is approached on another occasion, he said, and it's said there, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus answered and said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might, or all thy mind. On these two, or, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Matthew 22, 36 to 40. Mentioned a moment ago, Matthew 7, 12. Whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. Matthew 7, 13, 14. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Luke 13, 24. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many shall seek to enter in and shall not be able. Why am I looking at these passages? The first passage, Matthew 22, 36 to 40. Basically telling us what the two greatest commandments are. Loving God with all our heart, soul, and mind and loving our neighbor as ourselves. What I'm, the reason I'm bringing this passage up is because if you show me a couple who is devoted to those two commandments, you're going to see a good marriage. Let me say that again. When you see a couple, a man and wife, scripturally married, and they are devoted to those two commandments, to those two thoughts, those two overarching principles, you will see a successful marriage. It is impossible. Let me say that again. It is impossible to be totally dedicated, to be totally continually following those two greatest commandments. And then just to settle and say, well, whatever, it doesn't matter, nothing more. It doesn't matter. I'm not saying people can't change their minds and begin following a new direction. They can't. I'm saying that while they're following those two great commandments, while they continue in those two great commandments, they will have a successful marriage. What I'm saying is that there is a proportional relationship between the success of a marriage and the two people in that marriage holding those two things. Near and dear and first and foremost. Just think about it for a moment. Look at those other passages. Matthew 7, 12. Whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you even so to them. Is that not something that should be practiced in marriage? What you want done to you, don't you think it ought to be considered in what you do to your spouse? And if every person weighs every action with that in mind, does that person not then consider the best interest of that person? And thus will that not greatly affect how their marriage continues? What about the other two passages I mentioned next? The next two verses in Matthew 7. Entering in the straight gate. Whenever a person soberly meditates upon those two verses and realizes the implications of the, those two verses, that basically this, there are two pathways in life and there are not any others. There is a one pathway that leads to life and there is another pathway that leads to damnation. And that very comparatively speaking, Few people are going to find the one going to life. And many people, in other words, comparatively speaking, all of humanity being considered in the scope of that 
passage. Few people are going to find that way to life and they're going to enter into the damnation. They're going to enter in at the wide gate, follow the broad way, and they're going to go into damnation. When a person soberly considers those facts and, and, and makes decisions based on those kinds of thoughts, recognizing the, the seriousness of that situation and the reality of that situation, he or she will then be very careful about his or her marriage. So when I said prevention, how can we prevent divorce? We can prevent divorce by loving God with all our heart, soul, and mind. And loving our neighbor as ourself. And remembering that our spouse is our neighbor. The one to whom we will be most closely tied to for the rest of our lives. Let me say that again. Let us remember that our spouse, a person's spouse, is his or her neighbor. To whom he will be, he or she will be most closely tied to for the rest of their days. And if we will remember that that decision matters before we make it. And that after we've made it, that we're committed to following what's best in that situation. We can prevent divorce. If we love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, if we can love our neighbor as ourselves, if we do unto them as we'd have them do unto us, if we remember that there's only two ways of getting out of here, that is out of physical life, out of this earth, and that is the straight gate or the wide gate, that'll influence how we conduct ourselves. That'll influence the decisions we make. <coughs> Let's consider a couple of the examples from the past, right? Romans 15, 4, for whatsoever things were written before time were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Remember the flood I mentioned earlier. Obviously not God's original plan. He didn't want that to be the case. He wasn't desirous that whenever he created man, that, hey, I'm looking forward to destroying them with a the flood down the line. That wasn't his plan. He knew it would happen, but that's not his plan. That's not his desire. That's not his will. In the sense of he wanted it to be that way. But let's look at Genesis. Around verse chapters 4 through 6. And many of you have heard me go through these kinds of teachings before. It begins with Adam and Eve, right? Adam and Eve have Cain and Abel. You say, why are you getting all the way back there with the flood? There's a reason, right? Adam and Eve have Cain and Abel. After, process, after a process of time, Cain and Abel both worshipped God, right? They both offered sacrifices to God. Cain's was rejected by God. Abel's was accepted by God. We know why, right? Because God said, based on God's own questioning of the situation or statement in the situation, we can deduce why. Because God comes to Cain after Cain was upset about his worship being rejected. And God says to him, he said, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. In other words, you know, basically, Cain, you've made your choice about how this act of worship went. And thus, I rejected it because you did not follow my, pl my plan. Because that's inherent in the question, right? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? So in other words, since it was not accepted, he had not done well. He had not done according to the plan. And we go to Hebrews chapter 11, right? By faith, Abel offered unto God more excellent sacrifice than did Cain. So we see that Abel took the word of God and said, I'm going to follow that plan. I'm going to do what he said. I'm going to make my offering accordingly. So he did that. Cain, on the other hand, I don't know everything that Cain said or did in his mind. But I do know this. He rejected the will of God. He did not follow the plan. He offered in some other way. I mean, we know what they both offered. That's told us. I'm not saying we don't know what they offered. I'm saying I don't know everything that went through his mind. But I do know that this was not in his mind. It was not a, an undying, unfailing love for God with all his heart, soul, and mind and a love for his neighbor as himself. I know that that wasn't part of his plan. Because he said, well, big deal, whatever, I can do it this way. Because that's what he did. So obviously he chose it to some degree or another because that's what he did. Then... After his rejection of God's will regarding worship, 
he, and God comes to him basically reasoning with him, pleading with him to, to get him to change. I don't say pleading as if, uh, I say pleading as in God wanted him to change. That's what I mean. God wanted him to change. But did he? No. Instead of being, instead of being, to use, to borrow this phrase from the book of Acts, instead of being pricked in his heart, right? Acts 2, he was cut to the heart. Just like those in Acts 7 and in Acts 5. Because remember in Acts 5, when those Jews were cut to the heart, they sought opportunity to slay the apostles. In Acts 7, when those Jews were cut to the heart, they murdered Stephen. Versus that pricked in the heart, Acts chapter 2, those people said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And they obeyed. In other words, they, they, were, they were changed. They were willing to change their minds, change their actions, follow a new way. Well, Cain, whenever he is rejected, he doesn't show humility. He doesn't show you know, penitence. He doesn't show uh, spirit, recognizing his spiritual poverty and mourning over his sin as Jesus would have taught, as Jesus taught Matthew 5, 3 and following. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Which, by the way, eventually led all the way to Jesus' discussion on divorce in Matthew chapter 5, right? And they're not randomly connected in there. They are concisely and succinctly connected, building from that point in Matthew 5, 3, on to that idea of including one of the things that would be affected in your life is how you treat marriage. Whenever you follow the attitudes and you are the salt and the light, We'll get that, back to that in a moment if I remember to. But Cain left his rejection and he went and murdered his brother. Then what did he do? After murdering his brother, spilled his blood, just murdered him. Tell me how much of whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you also to them was going through his mind when he did that. Tell me how much a love for God and for fellow man was, was just, just saturating his mind as he slit his brother's throat. Just tell me how much of that was running through there. None. You say, well, why in the world are you talking about Cain and Abel? There's a reason. Then you leave that murder scene and what happens? Genesis 4.16. And he went out from the presence of Notice that digression. You and I have noticed it before. We've talked about it many times before. Refuse to, re to respect the will of God regarding worship. Refuse to respect his fellow man and the sanctity of life and God's law. He's refusing God's law in both instances, right? Then he's like, okay, I've had enough. And just leaves God. This is a child leaving home and saying, I never want you in my life again, mom or dad. That's exactly what this is, Genesis 4, 16. Cain is leaving the presence of God. He is saying, I don't want you in my life anymore because you can't leave the omnipresence of God. So that's not what this is to, that is not the thing to which this refers. This is, Cain is saying very plainly, God, I never want you in my life again. And then you read about the lineage of Cain. And then you read about how God gave Adam and Eve Seth, who then had Enos. And it basically mentions there as kind of a continuing the line, if you will, of, of Abel. But then you roll into chapter 6, and the sons of God, which by the way is just people who are following God, that lineage of Abel, saw the daughters of men, the descendants of Cain who had gone on their own self-willed way and took them wives of all which they chose. It's just marriage. Not a big deal. That marriage, those marriages I should say, gave birth to the, to the destruction of the entire world. Big deal who you marry, right? 
has eternal consequences, in fact. That's what happened in the period of the judges. They were supposed to go into the land of Canaan and they were supposed to get rid of all those people. Not make marriages with them. In fact, take, take a look at Exodus 34, verses 12 and following. Not a passage that we talk about a lot in the church, unfortunately. Or at least I, I haven't heard it tons in various situations. Take heed to thyself. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. Don't go to this new land and make covenants with these people. Verse 13, here's what you should do. But you shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. For thou shalt worship the Lord, or thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is jealous is a jealous God. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and they go a whoring after their gods and do sacrifice unto their gods and one call thee and thou eat of his sacrifice. Listen to this verse 16. Notice where it started. If you just leave them there and you become, and you kind of, you sort of start to go along with them, you're going to start going with them to do these things. You're going to be there with them. Listen to verse 16. You know what that naturally leads to next? You know what happens when you get young people together? Marriages start happening if they're interested in that kind of a thing. In other words, if they've been taught that that's what should happen next, if you're going to find someone and you're going to want to start a life with that person, a marriage should be what's next. The problem here is these are not the people with whom they should have been making marriages. Verse 16, And thou take of their daughters unto thy sons. Listen to this. And their daughters, it's not just talking about the women. It could have gone in any way. It could have been a daughter of Israel going and finding a son of them and the same result would have been the case. Their daughters go a-whoring after their gods and make thy sons go a-whoring after their gods. Listen to that language. He's saying if you go into that land and you marry those people and you just join up with them, guess what? It's going to be destruction. So what's the prevention? Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbors yourself. Find someone who's willing to do that too. Are we talking about people who are going to be sinlessly perfect? Absolutely not. If you say that, you're a sinner. Just letting you know. 1 John 1 8, 1 John 1 10. But we are saying that there is such a thing as walking in the light as he is in the light. 1 John 1 7. And intending to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and love our, loving our neighbor as ourselves. What happened to these people? They went into that land. They became like those people. And to put it in the words of God telling Abraham as to the timing of when his descendants would go into the land of Canaan. To put it into those words, God said, and in the fourth generation, he said, in that time frame they shall come. They shall go into the land. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So in other words, what happened is they went into the land of Canaan. They became like those people instead of driving them out, destroying them, destroying their altars. They actually brought them into their homes, married it up with them. But was there a consideration? Was there a consideration to, hey, are you going to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind and love your neighbor as yourself? Are you going to do unto others as you'd have them do unto you? Because think about that. When you put that into, into practice, when you have two people that, are, that have the right to be married and they are married and they are both willing to follow those two great commandments, think about, think about what that does and what problems that gets rid of. <clears throat> How much help they already have at their disposal. But think about the sad situation where a man marries a woman the man loves God with all his heart, soul, and mind and loves his neighbor as himself. But he marries a woman that's not so much interested in that, but she really loves him. Now, granted, I think you can make the point that he conceded in marrying her for whatever reason. If he marries her knowing that she does, that's not a thing she does is love God with all her heart, soul, and mind and loves her neighbor as herself. 
Where does that path logically lead? Well, the guy is going to try to follow God, do what God wants him to do. And that, that girl is going to follow whatever that thing is that she follows, which is not loving God with all her heart, soul, and mind, and loving your neighbor as herself. What's that going to get that man into? It's setting himself up for a danger, a, a sad and heartbreaking situation. What if the roles were reversed? Because it can be. It doesn't matter which part, which person you're talking about. Maybe the girl is the one that loved God with all her heart, soul, and mind, loved her neighbors herself. But she married this guy who doesn't. Is that a recipe for successful marriage? No. Because she can only, and don't get me wrong, there have been some wonderfully godly people who have had wondrous influences on people and still that, that, that uh, mate die lost. But they had a, a tremendous influence on them in their lives and changed their disposition and their attitudes about things. But still that person can die lost. Or there's been many situations where there's been a, a conversion. But oftentimes where there's a conversion, you already had a person who was very interested Loving God with all their heart, soul, and mind, and loving their neighbor as themselves. They just didn't quite understand exactly how to do it just yet. There's a big difference between marrying someone who's not a Christian, who has a serious regard for God and for his commandments, and is a has fear for God, who can then be taught, and then marrying someone who just has no concern whatsoever. It's a big difference. Let's not misalign what I'm saying. I'm not saying that you can't marry a non-Christian. The Bible never condemns that. I'm not saying anything of the sort. I am specifically and only saying that the success and happiness of a marriage is totally dependent upon the two people involved in it, loving God with all their heart, soul, and mind, and loving their neighbors themselves, and then what, to whatever degree, either individual in that marriage, or both for that matter, refuses to follow those principles. That is the degree to which that union will not be successful. There is a correlation there. There is a connection there. I mean, we saw how important it is. The world was destroyed by a flood because of bad marriages. The Israelite nation was destroyed by God because of bad marriages. So for someone to walk in to, a, to the thought and say, ah, oh, it doesn't really matter, it's not a big deal. The person has no clue whatsoever as to the matter of at hand. The person has no clue whatsoever as to the seriousness of the situation or to the eternal uh, consequences of, of that choice. Probably doesn't care. But you think about what's going on in that situation. The way you prevent, the best way to prevent a divorce is to get those two people together. The person that loves God with all his heart, soul, and mind and loves his neighbor as himself and then a woman that does the same. A man that does that and a woman that does that. You put those two together and guess what? You're going to, in so many cases, prevent a divorce. I mean, isn't that... I mean, the, the proper practice of love, right? We just talked about that in Matthew 22, but I mean, husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, yet the husband is still supposed to love God first and foremost. That's how he best cares for and loves his wife. Or she best cares for and loves her husband by putting God first. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Ephesians 5. 22. By first submitting to God. So let's go back to that exception. Remember I said the general rule, divorce plus remarriage equals adultery. That's the general rule. 
There is no other way around. The general rule is this plus this equals this. The one exception. Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. So what you have here is whenever a man divorces his wife for the reason of fornication. In other words, you have a husband and wife here. They've never been married before. They've, they've been married. One cheats on the other. It's the same rule for either party, whether it be the man or the woman. One cheats on the other. In other words, except to be for fornication, commits fornication. When that person commits fornication, that enters the exception into the general rule. And makes it so that the other spouse can put, let's say the man committed fornication. That woman could put away that man and marry another and not be committing adultery. Because her husband committed fornication. After they were married. Here they are married. He goes and he commits fornication with someone else. She then, based on that exception in Matthew 19, 9, has the scriptural authority to put him away. And he then, by the way, would have no option to marry anyone ever again. He would have to be by himself, in that sense, for the rest of his days. She can put him away and marry another. Think about that. <laughs> Even in that situation, even though there's this exception, the best situation would have definitely, obviously, been for both parties to continue to walk in loving God with all their heart, soul, and mind, and loving their neighbor as their self, and for that fornication to have never entered the situation. Right? That would have been what was best. Sometimes people make bad choices. And I'm not going to go through all the different, we don't have time. I'm not going to go through all the different, what if this happens, what if this happens, and try to spell out every scenario. The rule is the same every time. Divorce plus remarriage equals adultery. Except, whenever that divorce took place, because of a fornication, and then that second marriage happened for the person who was innocent, finding someone else who was eligible to be married. But think about that. that, that, that that's a scar that's still never going to heal. <clears throat> that's still a pain that someone's going to feel. Is it possible for that to happen? Yes, that's why the Lord gave the exception. Is it what his original plan was? Is it what his design is? Is it what his desire is? Is it what his will is? As in, does he just does he want someone to get married so that they can go through that so that then they can get into a second marriage? No. But is that possible? Yes. In that circumstance. Let me say it, let me leave it very plain. Divorce. Because <laughs> there's just been so much teaching on this and so much has, has been so false. Divorce plus remarriage, the general rule equals adultery. The only time that divorce plus remarriage doesn't equal adultery is whenever the divorce happens because one person in that marriage, that original marriage, committed fornication. And that is the reason that that spouse put that person away and then married. <coughs> Keep in mind, we're talking about, don't let this throw you for a loop, we're talking about God's definition of marriage. That's what I've been talking about this entire time. Not what man sees as marriage. Because man will define almost anything as marriage. Or who cares if you get married? They don't care. I'm not so much interested in what man calls marriage. Other than what does a... To make sure that I'm following the laws of the land whenever... That's the only thing I would care about what man considers a marriage in that original marriage that it followed the laws of the land, right? But 
we're talking about God's law. There is only one exception. And if it is that serious, and it is, think how much pain and heartache and how many lives we can better affect by making the right choice and teaching those that we know that are still young enough that they haven't been married yet that they would make the right choice when that time comes. I mean, I see a lot of, I mean, we have, we have several young people here that are X number of years away from marriage, perhaps, whatever that number is, 10, 12, I don't know, 15, whatever. If we impress upon their minds that seriousness and say, this is what you look for, we help set up a home. God's going to be the one that sets up the home, but we help influence it. Hey, this is the kind of home you want. And you have a lot of bearing on that home by choosing who you'll marry. And by making sure that that person has these things in mind. Whatever the thing is, whenever God says it, that's what we got to follow. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. But some people have done just what the Lord warned his disciples about when he sent them out on the great on the limited commission, rather. And he said, Whosoever shall love father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. People have done that in this regard. In other words, marriage, divorce, and remarriage is what the Bible says it is until it gets into someone's family. And then all of a sudden that all the all the rules change in that person's mind. You can't let that happen. Even if it enters your family at some point, you can't let that happen for you. You've got to hold what the Bible says. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by work. We walk by faith, not by sight. Second Corinthians five seven. Because we're going to be judged by that, right? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad, 2 Corinthians 5.10. So, why not let's seriously and soberly consider the will of God continually in our minds, as we already have done to a degree, and continue further to a greater degree, to the best of all of our abilities, as long as the Lord should give us time that we would grow in our understanding of the will of God and help others to grow in that understanding as well and try to try to be a good influence on those around us and teach those young people about here's what you look for. Help those people who are in marriages saying, look, the way you guys are going to be successful is you're going to both love God with all your heart, soul, and mind and love your neighbors yourself and you will be successful. And I will say this as one final thing before we extend the invitation. I probably should have said it already. When children are raised, when children are raised with this notion that nothing they ever say or do is wrong and everything in the world revolves around him or her and that you're my princess to the degree of you can do no wrong and all is good with you and your daddy's little girl or your daddy's little boy or mama's little boy or whoever it is. When they are raised with that notion that everything revolves around me and all attention must be given to me, let me ask, how does that work whenever they get into that marital situation and they are to love God with all their heart, soul, and mind and love their neighbors themselves? How are they going to fare without some big changes? They're not going to fare very well. Because the entirety of Christianity is based on selflessness. But you and I are, are living in a world that is training children to be egotistical, give me everything I want and no one can say wrong to me. And many adults are already that way. We have a serious problem on our hands, but we need to be cognizant of what's going on around us. But let us be this way in the church that we would adopt those two great commandments. We would seek the kingdom first. We would love God with all our heart, soul, and mind. We would love our neighbors ourselves. We would try to help people understand the will of God and help them follow the will of God and that we would try to help them see about what this thing is all about. 
And that it's not about, well, it's my way or your way. It's not that. And that rather children are to be raised being steered toward God. And groomed, if you will, trained for that righteous way of life to enter in at that straight gate, to follow that narrow way, to be among the few that are going to life, Matthew 7, 13, 14. Because Jesus himself said, Matthew, Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth will of my Father which is in heaven. So let me say this. You and I have to hear the word of God in order to be saved. And we have to not only hear that word, but we have to believe it. We have to believe that Jesus is the Christ. In other words, he's God in the flesh. We've got to believe that fact. He's the son of God. We've got to be willing to repent of our sins. We've got to be willing to say, I have done wrong and I need to change my mind to walk in a new way of life. Confess Christ. In other words, he is the son of God. Be willing to say that before men. And then be baptized for the remission of sins. To live a life of service and selflessness. Romans 6, 16 to, 16 to 18, right? Know you not to whom you yield yourself servants to obey? His servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. See, that's a big contrast to chapter 6, verse 1. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? How are we raising and, and training the next generations to follow us. How are your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren being raised and reared? What influence can you still have to help for the best? Push toward that. Work toward that. But always remember the way when it comes to divorce, it was never part of God's original plan. And it can be prevented with the right love and following the right things. The two greatest commandments. But there is that one exception, and only the one, to where divorce and then remarriage can take place and be acceptable in God's eyes. So not only one must obey, not only must one obey the gospel, but one must continue to walk in the light as he is in the light. And that's what the plan of salvation is. That's what the gospel is. And the gospel is the greatest proponent of successful marriages that God has ever given. If you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ, why not now? If you have obeyed and strayed away, why not come back? If we can help you, please come. While we stand and while we sing.